Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Brie Noble. I'm excited to be here with Justine Suzuki from Surf Music. We're going to talk a little bit about her journey. Um, She's got a lot of uh, cool experiences living in different countries, having a diverse cultural background, um, and then how she is currently helping musicians to expand their streams of income. So I'm excited to talk more about that, but I always like to start with the story. So Justine, like, let them know, you know, what is your background in music, how you got started in music, uh, what you've been doing in, you know, especially with the different um, countries that you've lived in. I know you were born in Japan, you've lived in Los Angeles, you're now currently in London. So wow, what a cool, diverse background um, must make for a really interesting story. Well, thank you so much, Bri. It's such an honor to be here. Um, You know, and also thank you for your platform and, you know, giving voice to to women in various pillars of the music industry. And I just wanted to say thank you for having me today. Um, But yeah, a little bit about my background. Um, I am born and raised in Tokyo, Japan. Um, My mom is American. My dad is Japanese. um, And, you know, my dad has also always been in the music industry. So I kind of born into this very music loving family. And my love for music came at a very early stage um, and early exposure and kind of my upbringing. But, um, you know, my career in music originally started, um, I moved to the U.S. when I was 18 um, for university. I went to school in Orange County. And um, from there, just kind of was really, um, you know, set on a path of wanting to explore a career in music. And, um, you know, I think a lot of um, the culture shock that comes with moving to a new city and also entering the music industry from a young age. Um, But, you know, I I think that... um, was just very hungry and eager to learn um, as much as I could. But at, when I first graduated from college, I started at a ad agency called 72 and Sunny doing music supervision and cultural um, partnerships there, um, thinking that I wanted to um, do music supervision for ad campaigns and for film and TV eventually one day. But um, I think very quickly I learned that um, I wanted to work with the songwriters and producers and the people that made music themselves. And um, I think ad people aren't, um, you know, just very different from music people. So um, (laughs) after that, I started, um, I took on a position at CSAC, um, which is a performing rights organization, um, being client facing, working with music publishers, songwriters, producers of every stage, um, and really developing um, their careers and helping to navigate what's a very complicated publishing and royalty um, space and making sure that um, songwriters and producers get paid and compensated fairly. And I think it was also just a really great way for me to build my network and my foundation and just from an educational standpoint. But from there, I really fell in love with working with songwriters and producers. And um, my I think my advocacy for um, people that create music really started there. Um, So I was there for about five years um, before I took on a position at Red Bull Songs, which was the music publishing division of Red Bull. So again, the energy drink we are familiar with, but was a very unconventional place to be doing music publishing, but gave people the platform really through marketing um, opportunities, working with legacy artists, and really focused on developing emerging talent within the Red Bull ecosystem, which I was really, um, you know, learned so much about um, just music publishing in general, but also, you know, I think giving again, the concept of giving wings um, to uh, people that might not have that platform or really, again, I think um, at that stage, I was really feeling like the music industry is feeling that there's a lack of development, I think, in big infrastructures, whether you're at a record label or on the publishing side. So for me, it's, 
you know, every aspect of my career, it's been very important to um, really take the time to develop because I think the longevity of a career really starts there. I know there's a lot of virality and a lot of numbers driven um, kind of metrics these days in the music industry that um, the turnaround for, you know, whether a record deal or a publishing deal um, really helps to, you know, elevate an individual's career, especially if you're at an emerging level. Um, I'm, I, you know, I just find that it was hard for me to fit into these infrastructures where I also felt like, you know, I do work at these big corporations. I do work at, um, in the publishing space, but am I a part of the problem? So, you know, but with every aspect of my career, I wanted to make sure that I was, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, I represent myself in the way that I like to do business is I, I always wanted to make sure that I was being a true advocate for um, the songwriters and producers that I was working with and develop these relationships with. And um, through that, you know, I think um, being from Japan and coming into an industry, um, music industry in, in the U.S., um, a part of that process for me was, you know, how do we also develop songwriters' careers outside of maybe the immediate network, the immediate infrastructures that um, I was a part of, you know, top 40 radio songs, you know, it's um, being in the publishing space, of course, like so hard to get a hit song. The pitching process is very um, complex and competitive and these days very saturated. So um, for me, it was always important. How do I bridge my cultural background and my knowledge of also um, my roots in Japan, you know, and every job that I'd had, I tried to, you know, kind of be that bridge between the U.S. and everything that I've learned within the music industry um, in L.A., but also bridging it with um, my relationships and my network in Japan as well. And, um, you know, I think what we realized, too, is that um, Japan and also what we've seen in Korea recently is they're both very lucrative music markets. And um, so wherever I was, um, whether it was at CSAC or at Red Bull or any of the songwriters and producers that I was representing, um, always wanted to try to help globalize their process and get their songs heard in other markets and pitch them for opportunities outside of, outside of you know, what was expected of me in my position in, in Los Angeles as well geographically. But um, that was always just kind of a part of my um, my process and what I wanted to, was passionate about, but also tapping into both sides of my cultural identity and how do you um, expand someone's, um, you know, the, the process of um, getting your music heard or finding opportunities in um, markets outside of your own or networks outside of your own um, and ones that you might not have access to. And so now um, I am chief creative officer at a music tech company called Surf Music. Um, it is a Japan-based um, B2B digital marketplace and ecosystem. So um, we are positioned between music and tech, but the platform allows um, songwriters, producers of any stage, um, whether you're Grammy nominated, billboard charting, but also, you know, we do represent and work with, um, you know, the emerging um, level producers and songwriters as well. But the goal is um, to be a platform that bridges um, meet people with that write music um, with opportunities from record labels, film and TV opportunities, gaming companies, um, advertising agencies, you know, different funnels in which you can monetize your music and get your music heard um, in markets outside of your own as well, because there is so much opportunity outside of what we might be familiar with, um, you know, being where we're positioned, where we're geographically located or where our networks exist. But um that is kind of where I'm positioned now, where I feel very culturally aligned on the projects that I'm working on, but also have found, you know, that sense of um, almost purpose and value, you know, with um, being able to also tap into, um, you know, both aspects of my culture and where I've been able to build my career and hopefully bring that knowledge and that experience to, to people and um, songwriters and producers, especially, and how they can, um, use our platform as as a tool and resource to um find other opportunities to monetize their music that's very cool and i know we really have that in common of wanting to be advocates for musicians indie musicians and just getting quality music out to more people which i love first i've got to ask since i've mm -hmm. lived in orange county for 10 years what college did, did you go you? to i went to chapman university Ha ha, right down the yes. street. I lived in Orange, oh, really? like literally down the street from Chapman. Oh, wow, well, a super years. small world. That's yep. amazing. Yeah, yep. that was, yep. it was an amazing place to go to school. I loved the environment and um, yeah, that was, that's amazing. It's a super small world. Yeah, that's cool. We used to go down to the circle and, you know, have some Cuban food and enjoy all the, yeah. you know, 
antique stores and stuff. So Definitely. that's that's awesome. And it, they do have a great. Um, so were you were you uh, going there for like music industry? Um, no, I actually studied PR and advertising, but oh, within the school. So I think, but again, my personal passion for music, which is why I thought, you know, initially I wanted to be a music supervisor. I think those worlds were both equally of interest to me, but um, yeah, just kind of love and with the the songwriter community a little more. Awesome. So when you were working at like Red Bull, for example, did you find that they were really open to music from indie artists from not, you know, not legacy artists, not artists that are well known if it had the right feel for what they wanted for their ad campaign? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I'd always kind of admired um, Red Bull's approach as, as a big brand and platform um, with a lot of influence to really give back to, um, again, we only primarily worked with emerging and developing um, songwriters, producers, and artists. Um, You know, I think the approach was very, um, you know, again, just wanting to give a voice and a platform to people that might not have access to um, resources like, uh, you know, an ecosystem like Red Bull. Um, So everything that we did was really keeping that in mind um, and being the most, um, you know, I think, very aspirational in that sense, in terms of giving back um, to songwriters, producers, and indie artists. Um, But with, um, with the deal, you know, I think a lot of, um, especially the programming and the kinds of projects we were working on was um, working with a legacy artist, for example, in order to create content around um, and an opportunity for, say, an, an independent or emerging songwriter who hadn't had big cuts with a big artist before. Um, We were, you know, definitely being very intentional about how do we give um, opportunities to, um, you know, again, developing songwriters and artists um, the chance to work with with a bigger name. Um, and that was a lot of the car- uh, the type of content we were creating, whether musically, but also from a marketing standpoint as well. We were able to create really great stories and um, video content pieces around, um, you know, giving people the opportunity to write with with a bigger artist. That's very cool. And did, what did you find that that did for artists' careers? I mean, I think sometimes artists think, well, you know, getting my song in a commercial, is that going to really do anything for me getting more streams or getting more, you know, concerts and things like that? Sure. I mean, I think there's always just the level of exposure, you know, that I think, um, you know, a company like like Red Bull, uh, the music departments are so, again, just additional to everything else that the company does. But um, again, I think Red Bull being a brand that was really passionate about music and um, again, something that they would um, really invest um, their resources, a lot of, you know, um, money, the platform, you know, everything to, in order to give um, those without a voice or may not traditionally have a voice, um, that opportunity. Um, so the exposure part, I think is really important, but also, um, again, investing the resources into allowing songwriters, producers, artists to achieve um, things that they might not have been able to. It's but really yeah, cool think- though, that, you know, I love their brand, Red Bull gives you wings. Right. And so that's really what they were doing for indie artists, which I mean, that's so like brand aligned that they did that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And at the time, too, it's again, dedicating entire teams to again, the record label was also something um, separate from the publishing division that I was working on. And then there was an entire sync team as well, specific Mm -hmm. for how do we give um, these songs a home, not just within, you know, this artist signed on the record label, but within um, their advertising and um, commercial spaces as well. So um, again, lots of individuals and teams dedicated to um, giving emerging level artists and songwriters that platform. And that's awesome. That's great that they did that. And then with your time at CSAC, did you find um, working with artists that there is a lot of confusion or like a misunderstanding or not even really knowing how royalties are dealt with in the music industry. Cause I find it very confusing <laughs> and, and I'm doing podcasts about it all the time, you know? Sure. Sure. No, absolutely. And I think that was really where I, again, fell into that position, not knowing too much. It was very early on in my career, but mm. immediately why I felt like I, I really resonated with, uh, you know, what purpose can I um, in my career and what value can I bring to 
you know, songwriters and producers who might not have the knowledge or the resources to navigate such a complex um, space. And, you know, being at a company like CSAC was a little more um, boutique in terms of um, really giving that individualized attention um, to each individual on this, you know, on the roster, which allowed us to really um, focus on, you know, again, every songwriter is at a different stage in their careers. Um, so any questions that they have, whether they're, you know, ha- at the very early stages, but also, you know, people that um, have had huge hits, but still need to find ways like to make sure that they're being paid correctly. Mm-hmm. If their music is being streamed overseas, you know, how you know, there's so many different layers to um, what it means to make sure that you're being compensated fairly. And I do think that um, my my time at CSAC for me was also very um, so valuable and rewarding because um, education is also something that's so important um, in terms of especially as a songwriter and creator making sure that you're not being exploited for you know a lot of the, the work that you're doing um, again I think um, being a part of you know again understanding how not just publishing works but also yeah how how do you get paid for um, and track down um money that is owed to you and with the digital age and how technology has kind of shifted the way that we listen to music um and also consume music um also directly affects how songwriters are getting paid or lack thereof so um for me it was really important to be a part of um i think a company that taught me so much but also how do i um you know pay it back and provide that same kind of, um, you know, knowledge and again, resources and, and help um, for songwriters and producers to also help understand um, the, the space a little more. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's great that you're helping to open up these other markets, but then people like me are like, but how do I collect all those royalties? Right. So do you, right. with your company now, Surf Music, do you deal with any of that like publishing administration, or do you recommend that the artists get a publishing administrator to make sure they're collecting everything? Yeah. So, um, Thank you for asking that question because it does get so much more complex when you are dealing with international territories. And again, um, I think with the globalization of music and how, um, again, not only are we discovering and listening to and consuming music, and you know, through technology, um, it also it. For us, we, when we, um, so for example, I, I will break down our business model a little bit just so that we can better understand kind of um, how we are helping songwriters um, find these opportunities um, through song placements. But, um, you know, again, through through these tools, um, we are pitching and placing um, unreleased demos um, through our ecosystem. So unreleased music for um, exclusive placement opportunities. So again, with record labels, um, film and TV opportunities that we've facilitated and worked on have not been, um, it's not traditional sync licensing, but we are doing exclusive syncs for specific projects that require music, but also um, working with, um, again, um, I can't uh, s- s- publicly speak about this yet, but it's a very, very well-known gaming company in Japan, an animation company um, that we are partnering with to also um, create these really cool um, collaborations w- through music and um, uh, with songwriters and producers based globally. So um, with that, you know, each opportunity, whether you're published or unpublished, um, we will work with you um, with the songwriters um, for these opportunities. And again, each territory, um, whether it's Japan or whether it's Korea, um, we've just recently entered Taiwan as well. Um, Each country and territory has different deal terms and um, how they're uh, publishing works is also very specific. Mm-hmm. So um, we, as a, again, behind the tech, we're a team of very real people. Um, a lot of us are um, multilingual, have experiences in various pillars of the music industry. And our CEO, Ken Kabori, is also a big hit songwriter and producer himself. And he is based in Japan. So um, again, very creator for creator mentality. And for us to be able to, each song placement does happen um, as any other song placement does, like whether you're published or unpublished, we will work with your your publishers. We will um, help uh, facilitate sub-publishing for you um, if you are unpublished and don't have representation in these said markets. Um, Fuji Pacific is one of the biggest um, music publishers in Japan and is our publishing partner as well, an early investor in our company. Um, so again, we are working with, um, you know, with the teams and our our partnerships to provide resources for um, these songwriters and producers, whether they are 
published or unpublished um, in order to make sure that these deals go through um, seamlessly. And there is a level of, I think, um, education that happens on both sides. Um, for obviously uh, a lot of the songwriters and producers based in the Western hemisphere, it's educating them on um, a lot of the cultural differences of the Asian music market, um, the different deal terms. Um, again, budgets are also very different. Um, so, you know, again, there's that layer of education that we are providing to songwriters and producers that may not have had opportunities um, in markets outside of their own. But then I think with Japan too, especially, and I will speak to Japan also because, um, you know, Japan is the second largest music market in the world, but um, have had a very difficult time globalizing um, their music outside of Japan. And, you know, they're a very domestic market. It's what makes it so unique and so special. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, is that a sustainable future for, um, you know, it, a, a music industry that is ever evolving and globalizing at a very rapid pace. Um, and, you know, again, with Japan too, the revenue really comes from, um, it's not streaming, it's not a lot of the, you know, again, publishing revenue that we're used to seeing outside of Japan, but a lot of it is still based on um, record sales, DVD sales, hmm. um, TV opportunities, live music, live performance. And that is why the market generates so much revenue year after year. Um, so for a lot of these songwriters and producers, um, we're placing songs for them with major label artists in Japan. And this is the types of revenue that they haven't seen, especially if you're um, an emerging level generationally, you know, like younger producers and songwriters have not seen this type of, you know, CD revenue or DVD revenue or even karaoke royalties, you know. Um, you so can, it's like we're going back to the 90s in a way. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And Japan still operates very much in that way, which is, wow. you know, very incredible. And it, But it's also been, you know, a reason why it's very hard for non-Japanese songwriters or producers to break into the market as well. It's um, very domestic, very insular and very um, mysterious, you know, industry. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, again, all of the things that do make the Japanese music market so unique and so special, um, that's very important for us to recognize. But at the same time, um, I think you see a lot of um, the music industry in Japan um, wanting to also globalize. They just don't know how or mm -hmm. um, haven't had the experience thus far. So we've been able to kind of help step in and shape those conversations from the inside out. And kind of to my point earlier about the education side as well, you know, there is a layer of education we're also providing Japanese record labels and Japanese publishers on how um, the rest of the world is used to working, you know? So again, talking about fair production track fees um, for songwriters and producers, or um, what are fair pu publishing splits, you know, for songwriters and producers. Um, historically, you know, in Japan, of course, any English demo um, that we pitch to a Japanese artist, they will um, assign, you know, Japanese lyricist to translate the lyrics for the artist. Um, but historically, um, Japanese lyricists have always been given 50% of the publishing and the writing fees uh, or splits, um, which, you know, the remaining, say there's four other songwriters on the on the song and they have to split that remaining 25. It just becomes a very unfair model. Wow. Um, historically, that's just the way it's always worked. So, you know, again, in situations like that, um, we are able to have these conversations and help shape um, a more fair, you know, propose equal splits across the board, you know, including the Japanese lyricists. Let's start there. Or, you know, every song that we have placed for these songwriters on our platform um, for, you know, a major label opportunity in Japan, for example, um, we've been able to really meet halfway and meet in the middle and help the Japanese music industry um, kind of evolve at their practices and their pro policies a little bit in terms of what is a fair deal for, um, you know, the music for songwriters and producers outside of Japan. Um, so we are providing, again, as a team, it's very important for us to educate both sides and make sure that we are also facilitating very intentional and fair, um, you know, deals for, for, you know, both parties involved. Yeah. You really are being an advocate for sure. Um, trying to, you know, get things equal and fair in mm -hmm. an industry that especially in Japan might need to like catch up a little bit for, you know, with what we're doing. And, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, they may have some practices that are better. Like people around here would be like, wow, I get to make money 
um, mm-hmm. from, you know, record sales and stuff like that. Like that's just not a thing right. anymore here. And exactly. it's, and karaoke is a great example of, of something that I think is, is awesome for songwriters that mm-hmm. we don't really get to tap into much anymore here. So that's mm-hmm. very cool. I'm curious, are there certain genres that do better in Japan um, that are common in the US? I'm assuming like pop, maybe adult contemporary. Are there are there like pretty Americanized genres that they don't have any interest in? Like, do they listen to country music or Americana or, you know, jazz? That's a great question, too, because I think, um, you know, it's very easy to think about what J-pop sounds and looks like. Mm-hmm. You know, I think there's a lot of girl groups and boy groups, idol groups that um, have historically been the face of J-pop music. But the reality is, like, if you look at the top charting songs in Japan, genre-wise, it is very diverse. Um, there is a big range of things that would take a number one charting song position, you know, um, like, for example, rock as a genre is still very, very prominent and very um, popular in Japan. Um, but also, of course, I think the biggest um, export, Japanese export for, I think, culture and music outside of Japan is anime music. Um, Mm -hmm. So that is also something that, again, very specific to a visual format. Um, A lot of them are on, you know, anime soundtracks or theme songs for different programs. But um, at the same time, a lot of these songs have very, very popular commercial success, you know, on um, the top charting uh, music charts as well. Um, But then, you know, a lot of singer songwriters are also super popular. Um, Again, it doesn't have to have super high production value. A lot of the time, Japanese audiences love just a simple, well-written melody and a real focus on Japanese lyrics. And um, Mm -hmm. something as simple as that can also resonate with um, huge audiences in Japan as well. And um, I think right now also, I mean, hip hop has always been, Japanese hip hop has always been popular, especially back in um, the 90s and early 2000s. But um, there is a very big resurgence and also um, a lot of strong female rappers that are kind of coming out of um, the Japanese hip hop scene, which has been really cool to see evolve. Um, Again, um, it's not just the stereotypical um, what we would think of as J-pop. So, again, popular music just does very much range. There's a huge range, Um, although I will say country music is probably one genre that has not quite Mm -hmm. crossed over. Um, in Japan. But I wonder, you know, I think that is, again, a genre that is also very, very, just only very specific to the U.S. Um, But yeah, I know that, I mean, there are many people on our team that also love country music too. So I wonder if there's something we could do there. But um, but yeah, otherwise very diverse, diverse, popular uh, genres in Japan for sure. Interesting. And so you're in London now. Do you, did you move there just so you could kind of be between those markets as far as like time zones or what made you move to London? Yeah, actually, um, my move to London was just very personal. Um, Mm -hmm. I want a working holiday visa and my little sister lives here. So, um, that was the initial reason why, however, you know, I think what I've found since being here, I've only been here a little over a year, so it's still very new. Um, but you know, as we all know, London is also very music rich, culture in ways that feels very different from the U.S. and different from Japan. Um, So I'm learning a lot about, um, again, what is considered popular here, but also it does feel like a very much more like open minded and progressive, um, Mm -hmm. you know, space to be in, in terms of um, when we're talking about, again, diverse music and genres and what is popular here. Um, However, on top of that, what I've also found is that um, there are a lot of songwriters and producers here that are also interested in writing for J-pop and writing for K-pop. So um, without me even expecting it, I've been able to find a network that I can also, you know, very much specifically help and add value to, um, you know, working together on um, in markets that, you know, I wasn't expecting to find here, but also, you know, being so geographically close to countries like Norway or Sweden, you know, um, those countries have always been on the forefront and even way before I think the K-pop crossover, a lot of um, these Nordic countries and their songwriters and producers have been writing for big J-pop artists and big K-pop artists and can kind of always been ahead of the curb in that sense. So, um, I'm finding a very valuable network here um, in ways that I didn't expect. And um, yeah, I'm just continuing to to build the foundation for surf music, I think, in Europe as well. Um, So the goal is hopefully we can expand into other emerging markets um, as a platform and as a company as well. Awesome. 
So I know that you've had recently come out with a kind of a new initiative in surf music. Do you, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for asking too, because um, historically, as I've kind of mentioned, um, you know, throughout this conversation, um, surf music has always been positioned to be um, a song pitching and placement platform between um, the East and the West markets. However, uh, we've just recently, um, as of earlier this month, um, we launched what is called surf sessions. So um, within um, the surf sessions portal, um, this allows songwriters and producers in our community to um, collaborate with other um, songwriters and producers in markets outside of their own. So again, um, still being that connector, but you know, our community of songwriters and producers is very, very global and very international. Again, we are focused on Japan and Korea, but the creator community is really based globally. We have people in Europe, um, obviously the US, um, Canada as well. And um, just very, uh, you know, we want a place and an uh, ecosystem for um, these creators to connect with each other and um, collaborate with each other um, in a very um, seamless way. Um, so we've built in file sharing components. Um, there's obviously the discoverability and connectivity aspect of um, an entire network of international music creators and music makers that you can tap into. Um, but on top of that, you know, there are functions within sessions that allows you to say you are um, based in the US and you've um, connected with a songwriter in Korea, but you don't speak each other's languages. Um, there is a real time language translation chat function wow. that allows you to communicate with these people. I will um, write my messages to, you know, um, my collaborator in English, but they will see it in Korean, for example, if that is their chosen language and vice versa, they'll respond to me in Korean, but I'll be able to see everything in English. So even if it's little tools and things like that, that we're building into the tech to really break down those barriers and again, connectivity between um, not just the B2B side, but also again, as creators, you know, it's, I think um, people want to break into other markets, but don't know how this really gives people that accessibility um, and, uh, you know, the ability to really create and share ideas real time. You can um, share STEM files, um, you can share MP3s, you can share even album artwork. Um, everything is real time. Anything that you would need to really fulfill the entire songwriting and collaboration cycle. And then once you are done with this collaboration um, in the sessions portal, uh, you can put the the song onto the marketplace for discoverability, you know, for all of the ARs and music buyers that I spoke about prior. Um, so there's an actual outlet for this song that you wrote and collaborated with, you know, maybe someone you found on the surf platform as well to um yeah, to at least have an outlet for the song as well. I love that. I love what you built in with the, you know, ability to to communicate in your own language. I think that's something that I haven't seen on any mm -hmm. other portals. So that's very awesome. So what is the vetting process? So like say people use your portal, you they create a song together and you put it they put it on the marketplace, but you know, pretty soon won't there just be so much music? You know how it, it gets with music libraries where there're just so many songs and then when someone comes there to look for something that they need for a commercial, you know, it, it really helps to have more, you know, specific like curation of what they could look for instead of just like a big vast sea of music. Of course. Yeah. So we've definitely thought about all of those things as well. Um, we have, and first of all, when you do upload songs to the marketplace um, or any demo um, in your own library as well, um, first of all, everything gets um, tagged automatically with our AI powered um, tagging technology. So from genre, BPM, key, mood, vocal presence, um, everything is built in. If you want to customize it further, you're more than welcome to. So through that tagging technology, um, we have an advanced filtering search section, which allows anybody that's searching for music to really get really specific about um, the taxonomy on genres. Um, again, what kind of songs and moods that they're looking for, um, vocal presence. Again, um, all of it is built in and the filters are cohesive across both the creator and the buyer side. So um, that makes the searching process much easier. But we also have a um, an AI powered um, search engine that you can, for example, if you're looking at 
hundreds of songs in a catalog or in a marketplace, um, thousands even at this point. Um, you can, for example, I'm looking for a song that sounds like Uptown Funk by Bruno Mars. I can um, copy the YouTube link to that song or a Spotify link or you know whatever link that you prefer, put it into the search engine and it will pull up the closest matching songs in the catalog to that song reference. Um, so you know again, that's just an example of ways that you can filter down um, you know the song, um, search process, but also within the portal, um, we've allowed songwriters and producers to also determine their own fees, you know, for these songs, for example, up front, you can include all your co-writers information, their publishers, any management com like contacts, if you would like to include that. Um, but also, you know, through upfront, you know, for example, a buyer, um, is looking for, um, they have about, you know, how, for example, a $5,000 budget for this song, they can filter out even further um, and match it with what the songwriters have priced their own songs to, you know? So I think that layer of transparency, even, and also for songwriters and producers to, to dictate what they find that their music is worth um, so that, you know, the technology is really matching the right songs to the right opportunities. And, you know, again, even on the buyer side, labels or music supervisors or anybody that has these specific parameters or deal terms around their projects can automatically search for those up front as well. So it does kind of, again, that layer of transparency allows people to see and um, find the most realistic, you know, songs for their projects based on what they're looking for. Um, so again, you know, we're kind of constantly building um, with our community too, it's very important for us to get the real time feedback from the songwriters and producers on our platform, as well as, you know, of course, the buyers on it as well, to really um, create real time and incorporate their feedback into a dream tool that um, is meant to help every pillar of the music industry and help um, be an extension of every creative process, no matter what stage that they are in and what pillar of the industry that they work in. Um, so these are the kinds of tools, um, for example, that we've kind of built in to, to help expedite that process a little bit and make your process a little more efficient. Yeah, the marketplace sounds awesome. Do you have also opportunities on the other side where there may be, you know, companies that are looking for a specific thing and you put out like an opportunity to the people in the community? Hey, can you write something for this? Or do you have something that fits? Yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, I didn't mention this upfront, but that is um, kind of one of our core features within the platform. So as a songwriter or producer, if you log into, um, into your portal, um, there is an opportunity or a brief uh, portal, which is just creative briefs from major labels. Um, again, all of our partnerships, every, you know, brands, companies that are looking for, for music, um, they will um, provide very detailed, um, you know, kind of descriptions and references for specific songs that they're looking for, depending on the projects. And we get those um, on a very weekly basis. So, you know, again, songwriters can write from scratch and submit ideas directly um, into the portal. Um, or if they have songs that match in their catalog, they can also submit those directly as well. But um, yeah, we kind of have like a constant just flow of creative opportunities um, for people to engage with and submit for. And on top of that, um, again, we also have a very, you know, internal pitching and curating process too, in terms of what songs are, you know, being shared with, um, with our direct partners. At That's exciting. Companies. Now, does it cost the artist at all to be involved with surf music? Yeah. So I, uh, one thing I do really want to, um, make sure that this is clear too, is that, um, surf is a base purely on a subscription model. Um, so we do not take any publishing or any royalties or any cut of um, any songs that are placed within our platform, which I think is, um, you know, just it, that was very important for us for songwriters and producers to maintain um, their ownership, you know, of of their of their music. Um, so the subscription is two tiered. Um, so again, songwriters can either between um, a $19.99 um, plan for uh, what we were calling Surf Plus monthly or um, $49.99 for Surf Pro. Um, there are just some limitations in terms of accessibility to 
um, maybe the number of songs you're submitting to um, creative opportunities and things like that. But the actual, you know, tech and the functionalities of like utilizing the library and like song tagging functions, all of that um, is available to you at the lower cost as well. But it's just um, a subscription model for those that are interested. And then again, of course, on the buyer side as well, um, we do have like corporate pricing and packages for um, all of the the companies and buyers that are on our platform as well. Um, but yes, again, it's just subscription based and we wanna make sure that all songwriters maintain um, their publishing on any opportunities placed through the platform. That's fantastic. And is there an app accompanying it? Is it just on desktop or can they kind of manage their catalog on their phone? Um, currently it's just on desktop and browser on, so you could do it on your mobile, but it's all through browser, but we are developing a native app, um, at the moment as well. So, um, that is a, a goal of ours. Got it. So this is all really awesome. And I, I just think that it, it's going to open people's minds to places that they can make money from their music that they haven't thought of. There's mm-hmm. definitely, you know, services like this in the US, taxi and things like that. But sure. the cool thing about this is that it's really opening up new markets that, you know, you're taking the trouble to go out and to make connections in those markets that generally people in the US and Canada don't have access to. So I love that mm-hmm. this, you know, you're making this, you're not just another marketplace right? That's kind of your your niche of trying to help globalize the music industry, which is very cool. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you want to make sure that people know about surf music? Um, No, I mean, thank you so much for, I mean, letting us share a little bit more about what we're building. But um, I think most importantly, it is, you know, for us, a big core of our mission and our just value proposition is really giving that power back to songwriters and music makers, um, whether it is finding your own opportunities um, for your music, um, expanding those opportunities, as we've mentioned in other markets, but also through other avenues that isn't just the traditional major label systems. But um, again, wanting to make sure that, you know, the people making the music have that um, the decision making power again, because I think there's so much in this industry and the way that it has evolved that demands so much of the music creator these days, you know, whether it's managing your own socials, you know, having TikTok virality, um, man, you know, being your own manager, you know, there's a lot of hats that I think songwriters and producers have to wear now. So our goal is with these tools and resources to give back that time for you to just be creative and to make music again that you love and hopefully find um, ways to monetize that through avenues that may not you may not have had access to before. Um, so that's kind of just wanted to share those final thoughts. And, um, you know, thank you so much for letting me share a little bit more about what we're building. Absolutely. And thank you for being such an advocate for singer, songwriters, artists, producers, we need more advocates like you. So thank you for what you put together, the way you're expanding markets for artists and just for sharing all of your knowledge and expertise today. Thank you so much, Bri. I really appreciate your kind words too. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at profitablemusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician. 